campus. Please, all welcome uh, to the stage, the founder of Mamu Mani uh, Architecture Reform, Arthur Mamu Mani. Hello, <laughs> and thank you so much for having me here. It's, uh, it's so great after COVID to be in person somewhere, uh, especially here. I'm impressed the biomaterials, the woodwork, the 3D printing, the, the, the plastics, the recrushing. It's all the stuff I love. So I'm just so impressed to be here and in this amazing building. So I'm going to speak about eco parametric architecture. Uh, but most importantly, I think I'm going to speak about a journey that we've done in the desert uh, with my students. Uh, I'm sure you've heard of Burning Man. It's in the US. It's another art festival, just like uh, Tanwin. And we've built a big temple there. Um, and we were, or I hope we're going to go back this summer to build another structure. And there are 10 principles at Burning Man. And I'll let you know how they inspired my work and the work of our practice. So this is the Burning Man Temple Galaxia. Um, it's a lattice, and uh, we're very interested in these molecular essential structures um, that are inclusive, that attract people, and that help interaction with volunteers. I heard a lot of things today about uh, the power, the empowerment of making. Uh, I've heard about biomaterials um, and biomimetics, um, how to get inspired by nature. This is something we're building um, in Romania soon. It's actually the first time I show it. And it is the union of two of those temples together to form hope and time. Um, we're interested in systems, not forms. And it's really important to understand that difference. When you think about forms, you think about fixed things that come from your mind and are, are sort of imposed onto reality. And when you deal with parametric design, which is something I teach all the time, I realized that actually it's more important to let materials speak, to let geometry speak, to let the machine tell you what they want. Um, and it's something that's very kind of counterintuitive. You think that design is one thing and that making is something else. And so I founded two companies, one for architecture and design, Mamumani, and one for fabrication, which I called FabPub for Fabrication Public. And it, one was for radical expression, like expression of my own uh, artistic uh, desires, of course. But the other one was going to be the yin to the yang, uh, which would be completely open to public and empowering others to do that. And I thought this uh, distinction was very important so that I wouldn't be disconnected with the making and so that others could also be inspired by the work we would do. And that complementarity is really important in our studio. Uh, this is our studio in London. Uh, you can see a lot of prototype, one-to-one -one scale, and it's absolutely essential because what we produce are not drawings or representation, but they're the thing itself. And that means there is no disconnect between what we conceive and what we end up with. And I think that's really important, and that is mostly thanks to uh, the technology that's all around you. So that technology, you see it as tech, but actually it's about empowerment. And I, I think that's a really important uh, distinction. Um, it also helps the planet in many ways that we are often not aware of. Uh, we can transfer files across uh, the planet uh, to machines that are locally available, and that's called distributed manufacturing. And then you can crush your material and use them again. I heard cradle to cradle today. Uh, this is exactly what this is about, the ability to reuse your material, uh, to repurpose them, and to recycle them, which are the three principles of the circular economy. So I heard about permanence, and there is often this contradiction between the idea of something durable that will last forever and something that should biodegrade. And I think it's really important we start thinking of our architecture as something that can be disassembled, not just assembled. Uh, I think we saw it plenty of time today uh, from the Japanese pavilion, etc. But uh, my office is in a container, a shipping container. Uh, actually, we, when we're doing well economically, we grow. We have more containers. When we're not doing well, we ungrow. Why should our buildings always be full and uh, not follow what nature does? You know, nature, when it doesn't have enough sun, up, it dies somewhere. And then it's born again somewhere else. And so this notion of permanence can be requestioned 
Um, and I think I learned that at Burning Man. Um, and so I'll take you through that and through the projects we've done and how they've inspired us to do the, this approach. Uh, these are some of the uh, projects I do with the students. Um, I call it eco-parametric, of course, because parametric design is often about geometry and the environment is often ignored as one of the main parameters. And um, this idea of designing systems instead of form is really much about understanding um, reality to some extent <laughs> and how to create uh, an architecture that emerges from our understanding of reality. And we're often disconnected to it. And that's because we don't necessarily, when we design, think that maybe wood can bend a certain amount of uh, curvature. And so we end up designing something and thinking, that wood doesn't do that. And, then, uh, and that's a problem. And so I really encourage you to go to a, a wood mill or um, talk to the craftsman and understand the limitation before even taking the pen and, and drawing anything. So this is, for example, um, um, a um, echo pod that we're doing in, in, in Mexico. And first thing is like, oh, what can the local wood do? How much can it bend? And all of these bends that you're seeing are actually the result of steam bending. I see you have woodworking here. Uh, steam bending is a technique to get curvature from the wood. So this, for example, if you unfold them, they're straight lines. And so how do you get curvature from straight line is something that I find fascinating. Um, and when should you use one kind of wood versus the other? I think Christoph answered really well. So this is a tower we're doing in Bali. Um, I actually haven't revealed that too much. So uh, this is my opportunity to talk about it. Um, the client bought a, uh, an, an old colonial bridge um, in Indonesia and took the reclaimed wood and used it for the core of our tower, uh, which is in iron wood. It's a very, very solid local wood, so he didn't have to cut new trees because wood is amazing in that sense that it can be recycled, recut, etc. cetera. Um, and the skin is in bamboo. Bamboo has its own problem, but if you use it as a skin, then it's already a lot less reliant on structural capability. So, so um, the way I started, uh, it was during the crisis of 2008, so there wasn't uh, many jobs available. And I was an architect, but I was taught these crazy technologies. So I was like, what to do? And so this was one of the first commission. It's, it's called the Magic Garden. It was using um, the idea of a smoking pattern in fashion and actually taking it into the computer, simulating how the fabric behaves and actually varying parametrically these patterns. Um, it was for Karen Millen, the beginning of a, of a really wonderful relationship with I would say origamis <laughs> in all forms. This is using a laser cutter. I, I heard laser quite a bit, but I, I don't speak Arabic very well. So, But this is a laser cutter. And what you can do is take the plywood, cut this lattice hinge, which is an open source uh, um, technique that you can find online on the Instructables, and bend the wood according to the proximity of these hinges. And what's nice is that wood bends in ways that are really unexpected and forming these modular elements, which are really important, actually, for, um, um, well, for, for in this case, three-dimensionality. It's something really fascinating to start from 2D and end up 3D. Uh, why? Because it, it saves you a lot of material. You travel flat pack, like what IKEA does, and then you bring it back in 3D. But there are so many ways to go 3D, um, not just 3D printing. <laughs> Sorry, 3D printing. Uh, there's other stuff. So this is an origami we did in... Uh, in Paris, uh, made a very, very fine uh, Zintec, which is just steel coated in zinc. And by adding curvature, by adding folds, you're adding strength. And that's really something that we're not fully aware of, but something flat is not very structural. You know, the egg, for example, is a very good example of curvature and strength. Um, so whilst I was developing architecture, um, I worked on a plugin for Grasshopper. I don't know if any of you uses Grasshopper. It's a great software for design. Silkworm is to have access to the language of the machine, which is G-code, for general code. So the way it goes is you tell the computer to uh, go somewhere, ta -ta 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 -ta, and how much should you extrude of material as you go somewhere. So here is the machine. Ta -ta 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 -ta. And, um, and so basically, when you speak the language of the machine directly, you can send the information, and therefore you can create patterns, and you can kind of play with the actual parameters of the printer. So you have direct access to what's going on. 
So this is uh, something that always fascinated me, is the material we use for printing, and you can go and see, it's called polylactic acid. And it's a plastic made from fermented sugar, or any starches. And it's a fascinating material. We did a life cycle assessment. I think it's important to show you that because if we speak sustainability, the way we measure if something is better than something else is through plotting all these parameters, as you can see, and then comparing materials. So uh, PLA is roughly 80% less carbon than conventional plastics. And it's really important to know that um, because it's also stronger. There's obviously problems with it. It uses land. Um, but that's when we need to think of vertical farms. And, and so when you start seeing the bigger picture, it allows you to change maybe the infrastructure that's needed and to think a little bit larger than just the form, the projects, et cetera, et cetera. So these are projects we did using polylactic acid. This is in Fortnum and Mason in London. Uh, this is for my home. Um, this is a, um, a, a pattern that I really love. And the modular uh, aspect of it means that we can print pieces of it and bring it together uh, little by little. This is a, a chandelier we're doing in Scotland, inspired by Gothic architecture. And this is a facade we're doing for a famous fashion brand that I cannot really reveal. Um, all in clay, 3D printed in clay. So 3D printing, we've done it in all scale, and really, uh, maybe that's uh, one of the largest projects. And then I'll take you to Riyadh, where we actually uh, worked on a project using sand. So this is a project using PLA. It's for COS, the fashion brand. And it was really a, a kind of experiment in modular design on using a certain size that can fit in our largest pr printer and actually distribute it around local fabrication spaces and actually get it, uh, get it built on time. I heard you for the pavilion, you had about a month to, uh, to make it, uh, which was very tight, I, I can see that. On the right, you see the project we did um, in, in Aldiria, in Riyadh, which is made from uh, sand and furan, which is a resin. And so we started with a, a sort of large scale intention and, um, and we realized the behavior of the material will never allow us to do that. Sand is really not good in tension. It's really good in compression. Um, but uh, we had a certain amount of time to print these, uh, these projects. So modularity comes in really handy. Um, in this case, we printed them in a sort of yin yang fashion. So we could print two per batches. Um, and then we would assemble them on a very conventional basis made of plywood. Um, all these lines that you're seeing are going through our software, um, not ours, but the software Caramba, which allows you to see the forces going through the project. And so it's really an expression of, um, of lines and forces, which I think 3D printing can be quite truthful about because we don't need to mass produce or reproduce things on and on like the modernist movement used to do. So this was inspired by the Najdi architecture, the crenellation on the fort, um, and, um, and it's time to take you to the desert, another desert. <laughs> this is Burning Man. Um, there are 10 principles which I find really fascinating. Radical inclusion, gifting, decommodification, self-reliance, self-expression. Maybe the one I want to emphasize is leaving no trace. Um, because that's a strange concept. So it's a city in the desert. I don't know if any of you have, have had the chance to go there. They build it in a week, um, and then they unbuild it, and then it goes back to nothing. And so that means that every year we get to re-experience or recreate a new city. And um, this was the founder, Larry Harvey, and he said, instead of doing art about the state of society, we do art that creates society around it. And this notion that there are... You know, creative people, non-creative people, I hate it. <laughs> I, you know, we were, I don't know if it's something in French, like I was always told, oh, you're a creative kind, but there are the non-creative kind. And I, I hate that as the, that idea because I think we're all creative. I think we all should be creative because that's how we can have an impact. And that city really breaks down that barrier. And so when we decided to take our students there, it's as much to create cool structures as it was to learn about the principles behind it. So this, for example, is made from off-the-shell ply, and the idea was to create this reciprocal structure that could be made from uh, a minimum amount of waste. I'll skip through a few of the student project, and then I'll reach out to the temple that we've done, uh, Temple Galaxia. This was inspired by traditional mukarnas, uh, again, laser cut and assembled um, with lashing. 
And this is two projects that taught me a lot uh, before starting to submit some of my projects. This is the Infinity Tree and Bismuth Bivouac. You see, one of them is really cool and really complex, and it's got these crazy uh, complicated nodes, and one is just this simple off-the-shelf timber. And why does it matter? Because uh, one was not symmetrical at all and was just pure parametric ego in a way. Um, and the other one was just based on what you can find in the stores. And so you can see the, 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 the trucks uh, here has really neat uh, elements. I love this picture because um, you know, the truck is also part of the design. Like the truck is a designer in a way. Um, you see here, we see a lot of stacks of puzzle. Nothing was labeled the right way. We didn't finish on time this project, whereas the one on the right was neat, clean, was finished on time, and so on. So this taught us a lot about how we should understand parametric design, that it doesn't need to be all different, no symmetry, no um, logic related to the real world. Reality is so essential. So this is a circular saw and pieces of two by four timber and we create tangen tangential dreams. Tangential dream was special because it had the dreams of people written onto their tangents, and so the community could interact with it. I heard a lot about community, and Burning Man has a special way of connecting people. This is at the temple of Burning Man, and people write all kinds of beautiful messages on it every year, um, and they build it together as, as a whole. And so it helps connect um, everyone together around a common construction. At the time, uh, I was working on a very special project. I was working on a hotel for the astronauts of Virgin Galactic before they go to space for space tourism. <laughs> they needed a space to stay. And this is something I used to do at school. I don't know if you learn uh, coding at school, um, but this was, it's called uh, Logo. And you have a little turtle that you kind of move around the space and you tell it to loop and it creates this natural geometry. And I think there's a real paradox uh, between the fact of using algorithm and algorithmic design and the fact that it connects you to nature, the fact that it looks so natural, yet is created in the computer. So this was the hotel, and I thought this would be a nice temple. <laughs> and that's when the journey of Galaxia started. So, of course, uh, a temple connects us to higher forces, and of course, our understanding of the universe is a little bit different now that we know there are black holes and the Milky Way and so on. And so this temple was a reflection of that understanding. Um, it's about 60 meters wide, 20 meters high, uh, and it was built by about 140 volunteers in about three weeks, maybe. Very, very, very hard endeavor. Very hard, but absolutely worth it. Um, what I find was uh, maybe the most inspiring bit was how everyone got together and believed in the project, and not just in, in the project or the design, but what it could do for them as well to be part of such an adventure. And um, the project was, of course, we had to fundraise. As per Burning Man, we had to raise about, uh, I don't know, half a million dollars or something by ourselves. And so we had to engage. We had to make sure it was simple. We had to actually um, make sure that everyone understood how to build it. So this is one of the 400 modules we have to put up. Um, absolutely mad, but because there was this uh, rotational symmetry, um, we could actually um, learn as we were building it. So the project was also a learning process for everyone. You can see here on the right, uh, this plan. This is the, uh, the master plan of our camp and of the, the fabrication. You have this sort of matrix of components and we had to build them one at a time, put them one at a time. We clustered them into uh, pieces that would be put up. Um, now, it is a, a very special place, not just because of you know, design, but of course, the way people interact with it and are absolutely honest with um, you know, the kind of messages they put inside and the way that uh, the project um, you know, is part of a certain ritual. And so there was something very special about it. I got married inside. <laughs> My wife is here with me. Um, and um, I feel really lucky to have been built the temple that I got married in. But uh, maybe most importantly, I feel very honored that um, people saw it as a place where they could let go and, and, and be honest with the fact that they weren't OK and speak about their emotions. And, um, and there was something very deep about building something together for that sake. 
and then we burnt it. <laughs> we burnt it in silence, 70,000 people quietly around it, crying, uh, just really, really emotionally attached to things. And this is really a lesson in letting go. Um, and it's an important lesson, to be honest, to be able to let go of what you've done, to start new, um, and maybe that's really circularity, is the idea that you can reinvent yourself, reinvent your um, negative feelings, transform them. And I think there was a much deeper, deeper thing about this ritual, actually. Um, and we had to clean it. Obviously, we had to leave absolutely no trace. We had magnet rakes. We had to do stacks of steel. We had to uh, bring a recycler to come and take everything. We had to actually uh, get rid of every single thing. Of course, I don't want to burn projects. Um, and so we wanted to go back to Burning Man. Uh, and hopefully, we're going to go back this summer. And we want to build this project. This is an amphitheater made of amphitheaters. Um, and it's called Catharsis. And the general idea was to actually disassemble it and reassemble it in London. That's why I was very interested by that Japanese pavilion. Um, this idea that um, maybe architecture can travel and bring a message with it. And maybe that could be a nicer ritual than <laughs> burning it. Um, now, I invite you tomorrow to uh, my master class. This will be about um, you know, uh, 3D printing. We are going to have um, 3D printing pen. And uh, we had that conversation at lunchtime about are the computers taking over? Uh, <laughs> and can you really um, you know, be original if you're using a tool? And I think so, provided that you understand the tool, uh, provided that you're uh, you know, driven by what it can do and you understand it rather than being a victim of it. And so tomorrow, we'll start drawing our modules, and we'll have a, a kind of syst systematic approach to design. And I think that's essential. Um, and uh, I hope you'll join me, and we'll build uh, amazing three-dimensional structures uh, from that. All right. Thank you very much uh, for today. It's such an honor to be here. Yeah. <laughs>
reinstall it in a different way, in, a, in another uh, direction, okay, opening the, 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 the floor for other ideas with the same component that we have instead of burning it out. So, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I completely agree. Um, th there is this ritual at, at Burning Man, and I, I'm suggesting a new one. I think that's the beauty of a place like this, is that you can reinvent rituals. And so I am 100% with you on that. I think re the, the idea of being able to reconfigure a building, the idea that the system can take different shapes, I think is the future for sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Any other questions? Welcome to Saudi Arabia. First of all, it's an honor to have you here. Thanks for Ethra. This is an amazing opportunity. Building with wood architecture, and reassembling it and reassembling how many times can you reuse the wood i think it's absolutely endless it's endless because we have for example our the oldest homes in uh, in the uk the tudors homes uh, you know the normans the one that have like the traditional timber uh, triangles they've been here the longest and they were designed to be disassembled um, and and yet they're just they're still there I think wood has this amazing ability to just uh, last and actually be uh, kind of malleable. You know, you, you, you can cut it, you can saw it. The, the, the bridge that we showed, I think it's about 100 years old, the bridge that was in the water as well. And yet we took it out and we're about to build that tower from it. Um, so, I mean, provided it's not damaged, provided it's not rotting. I think the main problem with wood is, of course, if it starts doing these things. And so that's why people add these additives to it, uh, which could be a problem. But uh, essentially, it's a, it's a material that's, um, yeah, that, that has a kind of an endless cycle. Contrary to, for example, things like plastics or, you know, I, I talking about uh, things like concrete, like I'm still wondering how we can recycle concrete. Um, I know it's possible, but I'm very curious. I, uh, maybe it's a question. Sorry, I shouldn't be diverting the question. But but I I, I'm, I'm, I always think of of actually we had a great conversation about materials and which one to use where. And there's no universal solutions really. We know concrete uh, creates uh, CO2. We know that uh, wood is a carbon sink. Uh, but you cannot use wood for dams and infrastructure, uh, for example. And so we were having a great conversation about what to use where, you know, what sort of scale and what is the scalability of what we can do from things. So there's a lot of critical thinking to be done. Uh, sorry, I went, I went on. And on. No, it's, not, it's an amazing answer, actually. Um, we would like to take one more question, if anybody has any question. Side, side. Well, thank, oh, we got a question. Um, hi. Um, I wanted like a piece of advice for us architects who are still like uh, uh, going through the uh, computational uh, parametric design. Where do you think is a good point to like stop interfering with the program and let the program do its work or like, I don't know, like interfere directly and uh, yeah. I, I love the question, and I think it's, a, it's hard, right? Because um, the more you understand how something works, the more you can trust it. And can we trust a, a machine, right? Can we trust a, a logic that is a little bit beyond us if we're not fully the inventor of it? And, and, and that is a big question. It's like saying, how much should I reinvent the wheel in order to drive my car, you know? Um, and, uh, you know, I think it's, it's about uh, being able to observe and understand and ask questions. Like, when I was learning parametric tools, I asked so many questions. People were tired of me. Like, I was just going through a process of just asking, 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 until I felt like, yeah, this is possible. But the thing is, we are never alone in design. Like, you have the engineers. Um, they guide you. You have the contractors. They guide you. Um, it's a dance between many, many crafts and many, many knowledge. Uh, architecture is, is this huge um, ecosystem of, of skills. And, and, um, and so I think it's ultimately about listening. And, and then once you feel like you've understood, you can let go. But obviously, there's no, 
th there's no perfect answer to that because it all depends on the project. Uh. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Thank you so much for the inspiring talk. Uh, we, we, we're actually really happy to have you today. Tonight uh, was actually enriching, you know, information. Thank you so much. And we would love to have you again. Thank it was you. Great so pleasure. Much. Thank you so much for having me, and, uh, and and congratulations. I mean, it's such a beautiful place. I mean, I'm I'm we, we are we were in awe to see such a beautiful building. Like it's. Uh, we're glad. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. So much. Thank you.